I was afraid of womanhood. Not that I'm not afraid now, but I've learned to pretend. I've learned to be flexible. In fact, I've developed some interesting tools to help me deal with this fear. Let me explain. Back in the 50s and 60s, when I was growing up, little girls were supposed to be kind and thoughtful and pretty and gentle and soft. And we were supposed to fit into roles that were sort of shadowy, really not quite clear what we were supposed to be. <laughs> There were plenty of role models all around us. We had our mothers, our aunts, our cousins, our sisters, and of course the ever-present media bombarding us with images and words telling us how to be. Now, my mother was different. She was a homemaker, but she and I didn't go out and do girly things together, and she didn't buy me pink outfits. Instead, she knew what I needed, and she bought me a book of cartoons. And I just ate it up. I drew and I drew, and since I knew that humor was acceptable in my family, I could draw, do what I wanted to do, and not have to perform, not have to speak. I was very shy, and I could still get approval. I was launched as a cartoonist. Now, when we're young, we don't always know. We know there are rules out there, but we don't always know, you know, we don't perform them right. Even though we are imprinted at birth with these things, and we're told what the most important color in the world is. We're told what shape we're supposed to be in. We're told what to wear and how to do our hair. And how to behave. <laughs> now, the rules that I'm talking about are constantly being monitored by the culture. We're being corrected. And the primary policemen are women, because we are the, we are the carriers of the tra tradition. We pass it down from, from generation to generation. Not only that, we always have this vague notion that something's expected of us. And on top of all of these rules, they keep changing. We, ha we, <laughs> we, don't know, we don't know what's going on half the time, so it puts us in a very tenuous position. Now, if you don't like these rules, and many of us don't, I know I didn't, and I still don't, even though I follow them half the time, not quite aware that I'm following them, what better way than to change them with humor? Humor relies on the traditions of a society. It takes what we know and it twists it. It takes the, the codes of behavior and the codes of dress, and it makes it unexpected, and that's what elicits a laugh. Now, what if you put together women and humor. I think you can get change. Because women are on the ground floor, and we know the tradition so well, we can bring a different voice to the table. Now, I started drawing in the middle of a lot of chaos. I grew up uh, not far from here in Washington, D.C., during the Civil Rights Movement, the assassinations, the uh, Watergate hearings, and then the feminist movement. And I think I was drawing, trying to figure out what was going on. And, and then also, my family was in chaos, and I drew to try to bring my family together. <laughs> Tried to bring my family together with laughter. Uh, it didn't work. My parents got divorced and my sister was arrested. But, <laughs> but I found my place. I found that I didn't have to wear high heels, I didn't have to wear pink, and I could feel like I fit in. Now, when I was a little older, in my 20s, there are not, I've realized that there are not many women in car cartooning, and I thought, well, maybe I can break the little glass ceiling of cartooning. And so I did. I became a cartoonist. And then I thought, in my 40s, I started thinking, well, why don't I do something? I always loved political cartoons, so why don't I do something with the content of my cartoons to, to make people think about the stupid rules that we're following, as well as laugh? Now, my perspective is a particularly... <laughs> My perspective is particularly American perspective. I can't help it. Um, 
I live here, even though I've traveled a lot, I still think like a, a, an American woman. But I believe that the rules that I'm talking about are universal, of course, that each, each culture has its different codes of behavior and dress and traditions, and each woman has to deal with these same things that we do here in the US. Consequently, we have <laughs> women because we're on the ground, we know the tradition, we have amazing antennae. Now, my work lately has been to collaborate with international cartoonists, which I so enjoy, and um, it's given me a greater appreciation for the power of cartoons to, to, to get at the truth, to get at the issues quickly and succinctly. And not only that, it can get to the viewer through not only the intellect, but through the heart. My work also has allowed me to collaborate with women cartoonists from across the world, countries such as um, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, Argentina, France, and we have sat together and laughed and talked and shared our difficulties, and these women are working so hard to get their voices heard in, in some, some very difficult circumstances, but I feel, I feel blessed to be able to work with them. And, we talk about how women have such strong perceptions because of our tenuous position and our, and our role as tradition keepers that we can have the great potential to be change agents. And I think, I truly believe, that we can change this thing one laugh at a time. Thank you. The precision of a watch is a function of its movement. For Rolex and for Hans Wilsdorf, to guarantee the precision of a timepiece, the pressing question was how to protect the movement itself from the elements, not only water, but also tiny particles of dust. In 1926, a major step was taken with the creation of the world's first waterproof and dustproof wristwatch. The Rolex Oyster was born. Over the years, subtle changes in the design continue to improve the Oyster, adding more comfort while keeping the style contemporary. And along with style, more functions have been added. A Rolex wristwatch was the first to show the date through a small aperture on the face. It was also the first wristwatch to spell out the day of the week in full. In the early 1950s, Rolex developed professional watches whose functions went far beyond telling the time. Launched in 1953, the Submariner was the first Rolex watch guaranteed waterproof to a depth of 330 feet. Already on an incredible journey of innovation and design, Rolex decided to push the boundaries even further. In 1960, the Bathyscaphe Trieste and Rolex made history. The submersible successfully dived to 35,800 feet below the surface of the ocean. A Rolex deep sea special was strapped to the outside. The development of undersea exploration led to the launching in 1967 of the Sea Dweller 2000, waterproof to a depth of 2,000 feet. In 2008, the Submariner in gold is redesigned and the case features a new unidirectional rotatable bezel with a serochrome disc. Fitted with the patented Rolex ring lock system, the Rolex Deep Sea safely descends to 12,800 feet. has incorporated countless hours and more than a century of experience, years of research, innovation, and development into every one of its models. And the benefits arising from this work, including waterproofness, precision, and durability, are the result of Rolex's continuous pursuit of perfection. From the most elegant and prestigious models to the professional timepieces, all are exquisitely crafted. Piece by piece, we design and manufacture every single watch. And the story continues.